Lunch Money is your social media home for special situations, workouts, and capital raising professionals. And this week, uh, the spotlight is on capital raising. Um, but let's give that a little context. Uh, anyone in the money business will tell you there's a lot of cash sloshing about the place. Uh, growth in broad money, a measure for money supply, uh, has spiked recently, as shown here. Credit growth has fallen behind a bit, leaving uh, a bit of a capital overhang. Um, uh, we all know where that money's come from, of course. Uh, the Australian government treasury said in May that uh, $291 billion, uh, had been spent on uh, pandemic uh, relief, one form or another. That, and that was as at May. Um, the stimulus comes off the back of uh, global stimulus. It's been arguably ongoing since the GFC. Uh, and since then, we've seen interest rates uh, slide into zero, uh, a process accelerated uh, since the pandemic, of course, as you can see from this chart. Uh, if you ask me, uh, this has caused a crowding out effect, uh, meaning private investment uh, has had to compete with free government money, distorting asset prices and uh, uh, impeding uh, the necessary process of creative destruction. Uh, but that's just my hobby horse, and it's just a shout out to our regular uh, insolvency practicing uh, viewers and listeners. Uh, when interest rates are zero, um, money piles into equity markets, private, uh, public, whatever you got. And the principles of ABC and Tina uh, enter the equation. ABC is anything but cash, and uh, Tina is there is no alternative. Uh, and if you think real estate's an alternative, then you didn't see what Kerry Stokes had to say earlier in the week in the Fin Review. Uh, he said that uh, he warned that property uh, asset prices are disconnected from fundamentals. Uh, and we've all been saying that for some time. Um, uh, which brings us to mergers, acquisitions and IPOs. Uh, when it comes to deal value, um, the data supports uh, the anecdote that this market is red hot. Uh, this chart, courtesy of uh, Picture Partners uh, and a bit of Googling on the interwebs, but I do get that in your email, Picture Partners. Thank you. Uh, and ditto IPOs. Uh, here is a chart uh, from First Advisors, and you can see that the blue numbers, uh, which are the numbers for the first half year to June 2021, almost uh, are almost as much as for the previous three years uh, combined in value. Uh, which brings us to this week's guest, uh, Steve Moulton. Uh, known to his friend as uh, as Maltz, uh, but but uh, you can only say that if you know him personally. G'day, Stephen. How are you doing? Where are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Nick. Is Maltz uh, like a, a an Aussie uh, abbreviation, or has it got something to do with uh, some sort of predilection to whiskey? No, it's just um, just a, I don't know whatever somebody calls you, Nick. <laughs> Who knows why we have nicknames? But it's stuck for a long time. No, worries. just an abbreviation. Very good, very good. Um, now, you are the chairman of Danaher Moulton. Uh, you're also a non-executive uh, director of Silk Logistics, the company that you recently floated and that you'll tell us a little bit about shortly. Uh, One-time director of Carlton Football Club, which would make a fascinating tale, I'm sure, uh, another time. Um, tell us what's been keeping you busy this, this week. Uh, well, as you, you said in the introduction, the M&A markets are just going gangbusters. Uh, the economy is awash with money um, and uh, there's lots of private equity money, venture capital money if for startups uh, and the deals are flowing. So uh, this week uh, has been ridiculously hectic. Um, I've completed two sell side transactions, uh, one on Monday night and the second on Tuesday night and I'm trying very hard, in fact, as we speak to complete the third sell side transaction um, today, but it may not happen until Monday. Uh, two of the, uh, the first transaction uh, is a, a telco reseller, which was acquired by a listed company. Second transaction was a medical devices uh, transaction that was um, uh, basically a, an acquisition by a private equity firm. And the third transaction we're trying to complete at the moment is a, um, a, a listed insurance broker acquiring a, uh, an insurance broking business. Wow. And with a deal value all up of around about, um, for those three transactions, between 60 and 80 million, depending if you look at the terms of them, which is really the most fertile part of the market. And Pitcher Partners will tell you that sort of sub $100 million space is where it's all happening. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, those sort of uh, national accounting firms that have got their uh, their debt advisory departments and push around the emails and picture partners, of course, being one of them. That, yeah, that it does seem to be the middle market space uh, that's red hot. Um, you may have heard that ABBA are getting back together again, so I'm going to try and celebrate that. Uh, certainly, money, money, money uh, is is the theme. Now, you, it's funny you mentioned uh, th those deals. Are they completed deals this week, or are they just deals entering your pipeline? No, no, those are two two completed deals, and the third one we're trying to complete. We've signed, so um, uh, it, it's basically um, uh, PSC. It's already announced publicly, of course, and okay. it's acquiring uh, the business of Alliance Insurance Broking. Now it's interesting. Yeah, my wife uh, SMS me this morning with uh, an article from the Irish Times uh, about uh, someone in her, her in-laws' family who's doing a $300 million uh, listing of a, of a telco business. So I wasn't sure whether it was to make me feel inadequate or, uh, or just to <laughs> fill me in on uh, family news from home. But uh, it, it, must be a, it, it must be a hot space. Um, so if these are deals that you're just completing, I mean, that, that can't be your whole workload. You must have other stuff. Uh, actually, to be honest with you, trying to get hold of you is nigh on impossible. I mean, luckily... It's been, I think, it's been a big yeah. week, Nick. Yeah, I mean, I got you into the diary about two or three months ago, and I think I've spoken to you once since. Um, but uh, so you you have been flat out. Well, the problem has been, Nick, you see, as you know, I've um, I've been involved in in large firms. More recently, Gaidens. Before that, Clayton Newts. I ran PwC Legal for a number of years, and anyone who's known me long enough would remember I spent twenty years at Mills Oakley. But um, to go into a small firm, and then suddenly there's a real following because you've got expertise that comes out of the top tier and the mid tier, um, and it's about building a team. And I have a, a team of, uh, of three, including me, uh, very uh, good and experienced M&A lawyers. Uh, but right now, in, including the two that have just completed, we've, um, we've got 14 transactions on the go, which is ridiculous. You know, that normally is, they're four, which means that we're all working around the clock uh, because uh, uh, it's, uh, you're, you're right in the furnace uh, when you get into into deal land and um anyway if the uh, if, if you don't like the heat in the kitchen you should get out so we're well, I guess still going it's, it's interesting because as a lawyer i mean you take the heat a lot um i know that everyone likes to blame the lawyers so their side likes to blame you know their lawyers like to blame your lawyers you know what i mean it's like so i guess that you, you're sort of under pressure to get the thing off your desk but by the same token obviously everything has to be uh you know 100 percent tickety boo so to speak yeah, well, look, I th <laughs> look, it's about, I've been around a long time. It, it's just about taking a commercial and sensible approach. My favourite expression is never let a lawyer get in the way of a good deal. Uh, yeah. And, you know, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And it's, it's, a, it's about, look, it's about, m and a is about risk allocation. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, depending on who you're acting for, you're just endeavouring to minimise the risk. You obviously want to get the transaction done. You don't want there to be any comebacks. Uh, and you know, and a lot of these can, uh, deals can be very complex, particularly from a legal perspective, because they involve more often than not accounting issues that lawyers aren't particularly skilled at, um, f whether they're net debt um, calculations or working capital adjustments to establish what items ought to be in the balance sheet and what, what um, should be regarded as uh, a networking capital adjustment and what shouldn't be. So um, they, it is complex. But nevertheless, uh, it is about having a, uh, your eye on what your client is trying to achieve uh, and, and making sure that you'll, uh, you'll bust down doors to get your client's deal done, whether you're acting for the buyer or the seller. Yeah, I guess that, that, you know, things yeah. like those networking capital adjustments, you do hear about those, uh, you know, right at the death, uh, getting in the way of, of, deals, of deals completing. I'm interested, a couple of things. Firstly, uh, are you finding? Let's we'll talk about IPOs in a minute. But when it comes to the MMAs, I guess there's a lot of crossover anyway. But um, is there anything apart from the fact there's a lot of money around, right? So deal flow is high. Uh, is there anything particularly tricky about about the MMAs uh, from your perspective? You know, as an advising lawyer, either buy side or sell side, that given the circumstances that we have now, the, the this this pandemic and on again, off again, shutdowns. You know, you're 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 you know a couple of weeks into a seven day uh, hard and fast. And I think you've got another four or eight weeks to go, or whatever it is. No, How I think I have. we've been going since uh, I think we're up to week four. Mm. So not quite seven days. It feels like it's a month, but anyway. What's different about it today to to say you know two years ago? Um, 
I, I think it must just be the amount of money out there. I think you're quite right. When the government goes splashing around um, a huge amount of money, billions and billions and billions of dollars in JobKeeper, uh, there are still plenty of businesses that are going well. Uh, and, you know, so if you're in tourism, uh, if you're in uh, retail, you know, life's not going to be grand, is it? Or in, in, indeed even education that relies on overseas students. But, you know, if we'll talk about um, uh, the IPO I've been involved in uh, from a, a non-executive director perspective. But, you know, transport and logistics, people are still buying uh, plenty of goods. Uh, they're getting a lot of it to the home. But there's no slowdown, you know, a, apart from uh, that uh, large ship, what was it called, Ever, the Evergreen that got stuck oh. in the Suez Canal for a month that um, yeah. caused a few hiccups or the occasional industrial disputes uh, at um, uh, at the, the, the wharfs in Sydney mm. um, uh, or, or in Brisbane. Uh, you know, a, apart from those things, you know, the logistics market has been belting along. Yeah. Uh, people are spending... Whilst, yes, they're saving because they're not spending money on going out to restaurants uh, and not as much money is being spent on booze, believe it or not, uh, the reality is is that um, a lot of businesses are still going amazingly well. It's hard to believe that people could even be talking about recession because it's obviously not as significant a part of the overall economy as you might think. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, yeah, well, look, we won't talk about that. Uh, I mean, the economy does seem to be booming. It doesn't make any sense to a lot of people. Uh, I no. think there's normally 5,000 insolvencies a year. Uh, and, you know, even even not adjusting for the effects of pandemic, they, they haven't happened. So there has to be a backlog of those. But, but look, leave, leaving that aside, um, it's interesting you mentioned tourism and, and obviously one of the big sources of M&A activity is uh, something of, uh, like a succession planning, you know, uh, you know, people in their 60s and et cetera wanting to, to cash in their chips. Um, I guess if you had a tourism business and you were planning on cashing in in a couple of years' time, a couple of years ago, you'd, you know, you'd be looking at a hard slog ahead of you. What, what seems to be the major source of deal flow? Is it, you know, is it that sort of thing or is it private equity firms flipping? What, what do you...? Um... Look, I mean, it's, um, it was interesting. I was just thinking about where most of our transactions are coming from. They've been in all from all over the place, uh, from um, uh, an IT business that was sold to a UK company late last year to a, a, a sports data business sold to a, a large um, European and, in fact, a global you know, sports data company. Um, th these ones I'm doing at the moment are, are sell side and we've got a, a, a large and one of the more interesting ones probably is we've got a large retailer uh, that's uh, currently going through a process um, and, and, you know, it's challenging because they have something like uh, 50 or 60 stores in Australia and some in New Zealand. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's fascinating to see the sort of the variety of things, but I think it has the fact that private equity has been involved in a number of those or international buyers suggests that, you know, that they see good opportunity in the Australian market at the moment uh, to acquire, you know, value accretive businesses. Yeah, well, I guess uh, all acquisitions want to be value accretive uh, in some form or another, I suppose. But uh, Yes, but some of them are not. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I, I wonder, um, yeah, so I, I guess also because there is this expectation of low growth, um, you know, where organic growth is particularly hard, then obviously you have uh, acquisition activity being driven there as well to, to grow via acquisition. Uh, um, and, of course, there's this weight of money uh, issue uh, as well. So you're doing on buying and buy and sell side. And what... What are what are sort of some of the, the major what what are some sort of are there any war stories from the past six or twelve months um, that that you've found instructive on the M and A side? Um, war stories. I think interestingly, uh, when um, you're dealing with a, um, a a bigger, if you're on the sell side and you're acting for a smaller company and you're dealing with a uh, a major buyer or a private equity firm, uh, they will tend to dictate how deals are to be done. So the you know the classic line is well this is the way we've uh, done it on the last ten transactions so you know uh, so that you know if you uh, you want this deal to be done you'll do it our way uh, and no doubt there are people who will just fold on that and, and not see the opportunity to negotiate certain things that um, are unreasonable so um, I suppose we're 
we're seeing, uh, you know, that kind of uh, uh, unbalanced uh, type of approach where, you know, big brother is trying to dictate terms to little brother. Uh, right. But we've right. been quite successful in establishing that you actually can negotiate these deals because, you know, it's if they really want your business bad enough, well, you know, there is give and take. So don't just accept that kind of bullish approach or bully right. approach, if you right. call it. On the, uh, I mean, I guess if you're acting for a seller, um, you know, given what you've just said, uh, if you're acting for a seller, there are, there are more buyers around, presumably. Now, I, I know that um, uh, any any matters that have crossed our desk, you know, they're, they're, you're not the only one looking at them, you know. And so does that put you in a stronger position? I mean, you mentioned don't be bullied, but does that put you in a stronger position as a seller in terms of negotiating those terms? Well, uh, of course it does. And look, at, you know, one of the most important parts in M&A is, uh, is the term sheet or the non-binding indicative offer that you typically get to start with. And, you know, they, by their very nature, they're non-binding because the binding documents would be the actual transaction documents themselves. But typically what's happening uh, with whether a private equity or, um, or strategic buyers are, are looking to obtain exclusivity. Uh, and there will be terms in the agreement that will be binding, confidentiality typically, exclusivity and just the jurisdiction. So uh, there are... There are those who will um, do what they can, buyers, that is, to obtain exclusivity, to lock you away. If you don't want to do that, you can go through a process, a little bit like this retail business that we're involved in selling on behalf of a, uh, a, of a large um, high net worth group uh, that, um, you know, it's gone through effectively a beauty parade. IMs have been sent out. Uh, data rooms have been opened up when there have been indicative bids put in um, uh, and right now we're actually drafting the the sale agreement, which will go into the data room, and uh, and then the uh, the bidders have been accepted for the purposes of going to the next round. We'll put their bids in. So, look, it really just depends on the uh, corporate advisor that you have, the deal people, whether they're an accounting firm or specialist advisors, uh, will recommend that the the way to maximise the the value for the seller is to go through, you know, a bid process or a beauty parade, as it's called as opposed to negotiating directly with one particular party. Yeah, I guess, yeah. and you do have competing advice there, I suppose, because it suits some people to advise you in one particular way. I guess the advisors want to advise, um, you know, and sometimes uh, the principals on both sides of the equation just want to get on and talk turkey. Listen, let's talk about IPOs. Um, you were involved uh, in, Ju well, in July, and I'm sure for a lot longer before then, uh, in the uh, IPO of Silk. Um, Silk Logistics, is that like? Uh, it was a pretty amazing experience. Um, just only briefly in relation to Silk Logistics Holdings, I've um, been involved uh, one way or the other with the company since 2013. Uh, and, um, and basically I acted for the management team uh, in a management buyout, uh, did the uh, introduction of a high net worth individual, a high net worth family that's well known who invested uh, uh, in in the business, along with the, the four senior management team, uh, and they acquired this business for not a great deal um, back in I think it was February two thousand and fourteen. Uh, a number of transactions along the way that saw um, that saw two of the founders uh, be bought out, as well as the the um, the high net worth family were bought out a number of years ago, uh, and via the introduction of a. Effective, I was a hedge fund from Hong Kong, call it a private equity firm, uh, that was um, uh, that significantly exited uh, during the IPO process and um, uh, back in uh, in July of this year. So um, it's a it's an amazing story of success in a way. Silk and you know back uh, when the the MBO happened, it was seventy million dollars of turnover, and um, uh, we've just re released our FY twenty one results. Uh, and um, I think it was around 320 million. Indeed, the uh, the EBIT, the final EBIT number, and the the revenue exceeded the prospectus forecast. You know, notwithstanding, obviously, the prospectus was uh, uh, was only a month or thereabouts before the IPO itself. But nevertheless, it's um, it's always good to come in at a number equal to or, or better than the forecast. The IPO uh, was a seventy million dollar raise, sixty million of which was used utilized to uh, basically to 
to buy out largely the private equity investor. It was a Hong Kong hedge fund. Uh, and uh, and the other $10 million was raised um, uh, essentially to, you know, uh, take the company to the stage where uh, it, it could meet some debt reduction uh, and, uh, uh, and obviously deal with the costs of it because the costs are plentiful. The advisors that we had on it um, were uh, 333 Capital, which is part of the Cordamenta Group. Yep. Um, yep. The brokers were Morgans and Shaws. Uh, the uh, and look, the accountants were uh, PwC. Obviously, the auditors are Deloitte. Um, PwC advised on the deal, and Gaydens acted in the uh, in the IPO. Uh, right. And look, it was it was a fascinating experience. I mean, I've been I don't put myself up as a uh, as a, a typical ECM lawyer who tends to specialise in that area. I've done a number of backdoor listings in the past and been involved in an IPO previously, but. Um, it was a case where you needed a, a branded firm and a former partner of mine when I was at Gaydens I did a fantastic job, a guy named Joel Rogers, uh, who was ex-K&L Gates before Gaydens. So we were very happy with um, with the way the process worked. Uh, some interesting stories uh, from a, uh, you know, a broker perspective. Uh, perspective. I, I, I think that we probably would have hoped to, uh, to obtain a, a better multiple um, a better multiple of uh, of of EBIT, of EBIT for the purposes of the uh, the pricing of the of the IPO, uh, and interestingly, in the end, you know, there's a there's the tension be- between getting enough interest and getting the price right, and I think probably the the price at two dollars a share uh, was the right price, and it's been trading variously around the sort of the two thirty to two sort of forty five mark. Uh, in right. fact, I don't know. It was up today by about. I think it was trading at about um, two dollars forty or thereabouts today. Yeah, I mean, look, I've just uh, I've got to put my glasses on here. I was on IPO Watch a little bit earlier, uh, which lists all the IPOs for the year. Uh, Silk Logistics opened at two dollars, obviously, as you said, eight times uh, EBITDA. I think it's. I don't know how current this numbers are. But it's two forty-two. It's two dollars forty-two at the moment, there you go. or fifteen That's minutes about- ago. That's about twenty percent up. So uh, having a look at having a look at the class of July twenty one, uh, apart from a couple of uh, uh, mining ones, it's uh, it looks uh, it looks it looks pretty good. Okay, so um, it's a it's a really solid it's a solid business. Um, basically, Silk focuses on uh, port logistics and contract logistics. Yeah. Uh, so you know, port logistics is a substantial part of the business. It's um it's probably close to two thirds of uh, of its revenue. Uh, we operate something like I think it's something like 24 uh, warehouses around the country, and in some cases we're in we're in customer warehouses. I joined. I was asked to join the board as a non-executive director back in uh, July last year, uh, and so uh, you know it's been a, a it's been a fascinating um, transformation from you know a privately held company with two principal founders uh, or part of the management team, of course. Uh, the original management team who bought it through the MBO, but uh, uh, and and having a uh, the support of a fantastic uh, group uh, which is uh, Tor T O R um, uh, out of Hong Kong supporting the business and but then you know having it transform from a private company into uh, a listed company has been quite an experience. Well, it sounds uh, like and- uh, quite quite a journey. It looks like you, you said that you. Uh, were involved in 2014 uh, when it was an MBO. You know, have there yeah. been acquisitions along the way, or has that growth from 70 million to 320 million all been all organic? No, um, the uh, there've been there've been three uh, really significant uh, acquisitions, uh, and they all happened in 2018 and 19, which I did when I was at Gaydens. Uh, we acquired a business called CSS yep. um, in uh, in Queensland, uh, first followed by um, a uh, uh, another business in in Sydney, um, and and more recently, uh, well, in fact, it was only a year later in two thousand and nineteen, we acquired acquired Rock Brothers, uh, which is a substantial player in the at the Port of Melbourne. Right, so, well, it's been a uh, it's been a, a fan, as I say, a fantastic journey. It sounds like uh, the sort of thing that should be uh, in an MBA case study book. You've got yeah, say, well, to go from you know, I mean, and and management buyout as, as we say in our prospectus and our and our most recent um, uh, annual results uh, that um, that we are going to look at acquisitions, and of course, one of the 
you know, all of the acquisitions in the past have been effectively either, well, mostly debt funded or with some cash. But um, it was fantastic to have a partner like Tor to, to back us um, and, um, and, and, we, and, and a supportive bank at the time. And uh, we've now got the ability to, because of the position of the company, it it's, uh, has a very low debt, uh, uh, a, a very low debt uh, to um, uh, turnover and equity ratio. Uh, so we've got capacity to borrow further if we need to, but we've also now got capacity uh, to be able to obviously offer script, which is one of the advantages about being listed. Well, I mean, yeah, the fantastic thing is when you when you're in, you know, there's there's sort of two markets. When you're in the zone, and you're in the zone, obviously there with Silk Logistics, uh, you know, the corporate finance departments of all the major banks are just bending, you know, bending over backwards to uh, to write your large checks because you tick all the boxes. You know, you're listed, uh, you've got track record. Uh, and and so and if you've uh, if you if the balance sheet is is the way you're suggesting it is, it, it would have enormous war chests. That's 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 for sure. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned uh, when we were chatting a little bit earlier, you we you know we have uh, something of a uh, a finance broker following. And uh, um, tell us a couple of your uh, experiences uh, floating or in the M and A with uh, in finance brokers. Yeah, so um, probably the best best known one um, goes back to 2015. It's a long time ago now, but um, uh, I was involved when I was at Mills Oakley with Plan Australia, and in fact, um, we had um, we were there from start up back in 1998 until exit. It was an amazing story, Plan, because we ended up selling Plan for 28 times EBITDA, uh, which was something of a record to Challenger. Uh, and uh, for any finance blo blo brokers, the whole thing started with a, a very well-known fellow by the name of Glenn Mitchell, who's at Vow, uh, and uh, and Mitch made the introduction to Brian Benari, who, as you might all know, was a long-time CEO of uh, Challenger. Uh, and we negotiated a deal. You know, they'd picked up... Um, uh, uh, I've just forgot the, the, the name of it again, the, um, the white oh, label. The one out of WA. No, no, it starts... Um, Oh, look, anyway, it'll come to me again. Yeah. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the it was a great story. Uh, it started the roll-up. I think they ended up getting choice and fast after that, ultimately sold them to, to NAB and NAB have more recently parted ways with the, the aggregation business. Um, uh, not long, not long, not that long after it, we, uh, we sold um, Independent Mortgage Corporation, IMC, uh, which was a good deal. And then um, sometime... Later, it was still a while ago now, but the original sale of National Mortgage Brokers um, to Aussie Home Loans, which uh, is uh, obviously it was on then on sold to Liberty Financial. So yeah, it must um, be interesting. So those are probably the most notable finance broker deals that I've done. I remember the Plan Australia uh, story. Uh, you know, I knew people involved right at the beginning, um, and it was uh, it, it was. Um, uh, pioneering, really. I mean, there's, it's not like we've got a history in Australia of of uh, brokers. You know, it was a, it, it was you know there was a, a confluence of technology and you know capital markets uh, that made all of that possible. Of course, uh, it, it must have been difficult pricing those transactions early on. I mean, you you wouldn't really have had guides for what this should be. Well, look, I, I think I think the the great thing about um, about plan, and you know all about it, Nick, from your background. Uh, is that when it started off, it was the second aggregator because obviously AFG was the first and that had already started. Um, and, um, and and basically the visionaries who had, were the founders, Alex Maliris and, and Rob, uh, knew what they wanted to do and they wanted to go national, you know, straight off the bat rather than just sort of starting in Melbourne and then ex spreading the wings. Uh, and they needed a lot of money to do that. So... Um, one of my former partners, Lawrence Davis, uh, introduced the uh, the K family cash resources, which Nick knows a lot about, having been one of the uh, the founding people involved in cash resources, and uh, uh, and they put they put some money in by way of debt, some millions of dollars, got a nice slab of equity out of it, but that money was used really well by Alex in particular to build, you know, the infrastructure that became Plan and. Now, by the time we exited, we had, I think we were doing $2 billion a month uh, and had something like 2,500 broker members. 
It's a phenomenal so, story. It's an Absolutely. extraordinary story, um, you know, and, you know, the deal, I think, in the end, Challenger paid something like $130, $740 million for the business. And t- tell me, what do you think of that market today? I mean, there are, you know, there are, st- oh, that's on the home loan side of things. What about yeah. the commercial, you know, the, the, the lease equipment brokers and those sorts of things? I mean, do you, there has been some activity. I think there's a COG, what's it called, Consolidated Group, uh, are listed. Uh, are you seeing any more activity? Yeah, not not, not a lot. Not a lot. You know, I mean, that's um, and I, I don't have a lot of visibility over the sort of spend. You might uh, be better placed, Nick, to answer this. Just about in terms of uh, equipment financing. Uh, what, an area that I do know uh, that is really burgeoning at the moment is, is um, agri- agriculture farming. Right. You know, there's. Uh, the farmers of, of having uh, bumper times. I actually managed to get out between lockdown five and six, uh, and uh, because you can't go anywhere, uh, ended up doing a bit of a trip through the Wimmera and the Mallee, and uh, they've had plenty of rain. You know, the wheat's beginning to grow, the the barley and um, lentils and chickpeas and whatever. But uh, the farmers are having a pretty good time, and as a result of that, you know, the um, farm equipment. Uh, distributors are doing very well and there's obviously a great need for equipment finance. So I, I know of a equipment finance broker who also is involved in mortgages uh, and other, and other um, finance lending but is doing really, really well out of um, equipment finance to the, the, the farming sector. Well, I mean, the great thing about equi- uh, farming, that agri-equipment is it's nice and chunky uh, and, uh, yeah. you know, um, you know, not, not quite in the same league as uh, yellow goods in the in the mining and civil spaces, but uh, certainly certainly nice and chunky, that's for sure, and if you've got a niche there. And the other thing is that those farms, I mean, they are, you know, they're not generally classified, I don't think, as M&A activity, but when you're, you know, when you're selling a 20 or $30 million beef cattle farm, I mean, the same principles apply, don't they? Oh, of course they do. One thing I just interesting um, that your uh, viewers might be interested in, I find uh, extraordinary. This is the hottest M&A market that I or many others have seen in years. In fact, I don't even remember it being like this. I've got a team of three really good experienced lawyers. I'm trying to get more. We'll just mention briefly about how hard that is. And we've got 14 transactions on the go at the moment. That's ridiculous. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the, and the, the pipeline for transactions over the next three to four months is continuing to grow and I'm glad they're not arriving uh, right now. Although, as I said, fortunately, I'll be able to get rid of three off that list this week. But um, well, one can of I just the say other my producer, my producer told me to turn off my email because the, the notifications keep going, but I think it's your email. Uh, you're getting the Oh, yeah, no, probably. Keep, I'm sorry. I'm the, just, deal, uh, the deals uh, just keep flooding into your inbox. Uh, as, yeah, well. As, uh, as, uh, as we speak. I probably <laughs> don't, don't worry about that. I've been here, so sorry about that. But, no, um, no, 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 no. I don't know how to turn it off without not hearing you. But one thing is extraordinary and uh, I find amazing is the drain of young legal talent who are heading overseas again. No, really? Really? They're going, yeah, they are going to the US. They're going to London. So as, as uh, those economies are opening up again, uh, living with COVID, people are heading back overseas. The problem is it's a one-way street. Mm-hmm. You, can, you can leave, but you can't come back in again. So yeah, um, yeah, it's the opposite of a hotel, California. It's it's interesting. We've been talking about that that whole lockdown thing for ages. But you touched on there about, and I hadn't really thought about it, but you touched on the difficulty of getting getting talent. Um, and, and I do see your wise crack on the screen there, uh, Thomas. I've just got one of our one of our viewers has made a made a wise crack. Uh, Thomas Russell. Is that a good thing? Lawyers right? leaving the country. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. Um, but uh, so, so how do you go about it? Uh, well, you just work harder. I mean, yeah. apparently somebody, a recruiter told me that Ashurst, obviously, which is one of the top five or six firms in the, in the country as a global firm, that their recruiting needs that they budgeted for for FY22 were 130 lawyers. Wow. Well, 130 lawyers. Yeah, Again, you know, so that they'd have a reasonably high bar to get over. I would have thought a firm like that. We had we we had T N Kerr on last week, uh, who's just left um, uh, Lander and Rogers to set up his own firm, and he's he's taken a team with him. I'm sure he's 
you know, would, would cause them some some form of, uh, of indigestion there. Let me ask you, because we are, the, the clock is uh, beginning to run down, believe it or not. These things go awfully quick. Um, what, uh, this is a question I'm going to start asking all of my guests, and I, and I apologise, I didn't give you a warning of this. I heard it on a, on a podcast, I thought it's a great question. In, you know, you've got a lot of experience behind you, a lot of experience ahead of you by the sounds of all that pipeline you've got. But what is the lesson in your game that took you the longest to learn? <laughs> the lesson that took me the longest to learn. Oh, well, that's that's a really hard question. I should have emailed you that a week ago. Um, I think I should have gone out on my own a long, long time ago. Yeah. I, you know, you, you feel uh, you feel comfortable sort of being in the in the cloisters of large professional firms, and you tend to put up with the bureaucracy and the politics that goes on with it, but. Um, uh, it's extraordinary uh, the following that has come from people I've known for many, many years but have never used me for legal work before but are now uh, perceiving value. They'd just rather deal with a, a small, nimble organisation and uh, and as a result of it, um, you know, I think that um, uh, we're, we're getting flooded with work and there are a lot of these boutique firms like the person you mentioned before from Landon Rogers, you know, the reality is there's not a lot of goodwill in law firms. It's in the individuals. So uh, that's really been flowing. And the other thing I think um, when I was leaving Gaydon's, I, I went and saw a fa fantastic person who, who helped to um, identify what actually is it that you really like doing. And I sort of knew but hadn't ever been able to articulate it. And essentially uh, this Danaher Moulton opportunity had to tick three boxes. Uh, and, and that one was building building a business you know that I, I had a an ownership in secondly it's about building capability because i you know after you've been around for a long time it's about helping helping the kids come through and and the next part was really just about helping people which is staff and your clients so maybe it took me a long time to to realize that that's what drove me and it wasn't about all the other things you know chest beating and making money that was important very interesting. Very, interesting. very, very interesting. Uh, very interesting words. I started watching uh, a TV show on Apple TV called Ted Lasso. I don't know if you've seen uh -huh. it. Have yeah, it's seen terrific. It? it is terrific. And uh, he, he he's the American football coach who comes over to England to coach uh, an IPL team. And he says to one of the journalists, to their amazement, that it, winning or losing every week is not really what it's about for him. And he means it sincerely. He, he says, and I've just got to try and think on that, but basically what you just said, he says what's really important to him is um, helping the people around him be the best that they can be. Um, so I, I think there might be a little bit of a reflection in that in uh, in that third box that you uh, that you just mentioned. Can I tell you something that I found really amusing? When uh, it was Dan at Her Legal that I joined, um, a long time ago, Dennis had built up a, a terrific little practice based on um, estate planning, uh, a bit of property, a little bit of commercial. But it was very much a um, it was very much a, a, a suburban practice, and Dennis wanted to grow bigger and get better quality staff, and and so he uh, he he had a crack at me over a few years, and eventually I, I, I gave in and, and joined him. But uh, we rebranded and, and used a, a, a good group of people to redesign our website and what have you and got all the SEO and the SEM. Uh, and one thing I've been really surprised about is somehow we've ended up on page one for M&A lawyers in Melbourne uh, oh, and wow. uh, two of the transactions that we've completed in the last couple of months came through the internet. You're kidding. You're kidding. No? That, that is that, absolutely that is amazing. That is absolutely research, amazing. Which wow. um, I find wow. extraordinary. It is. It absolutely is. Oh, wow. That, that is incredible. All right. Well, look, um, we we are going to wrap it up, but I'll just ask you for uh, for your final comments. Again, bearing in mind that we do have a few finance brokers watching, maybe what is your advice to, let's say, a lease broker who has uh, clients who uh, are looking at either buying or selling businesses at the moment? Um, well, look, look, I mean, if you're... If, if you want to sell your business, it's a, you've got to look at what will actually create the most value. Um, I, I recall there was a, a mortgage broker, for example, who was doing a budget coaching way back in the in mid-2000s, and I said to him, you're mad. Why don't you create some value in your business uh, and go, try mortgage management? So this was before the GFC and mortgage management then obviously sort of vaguely disappeared. But 
you know, if he ever wanted to sell that business, you know, today, he'd get some really good value out of it. So I think it comes down to, you know, creating a brand and creating a, a, a firm that's not all about the individual person so that there's actually some business goodwill that will attach to it. That's one of the more important things. Uh, and and the, probably the other thing is, is get some really good advice about your structure uh, from a tax perspective because tax is the, the biggest issues in any transaction, particularly on the sell side, because uh, in a classic example, I had someone more recently say, oh, can you help us document a transaction? There's a couple of million dollars. They're doing an asset sale. Um, they own the company. It's not a trust. And I said, do you realise that you'll pay twice as much capital gains tax as you would if you sold the shares in the business rather than its assets? And they said, no. I said, well, you, if, you, uh, if you sell the shares, you'll, get a, you'll only pay capital gains tax on 50% of the gain. So, you know, that's a really important thing to understand. Are you, is your structure the right structure? Is it set up well to create the most value um, in terms of business goodwill? Um, and um, and that, those are probably the uh, the most important things to think about. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, uh, Stephen Moulton, um, thank you very, very much for joining us. It really has been an honour to have you on, uh, given that, as I say, you, you're a very hard man to get hold of for this sort of thing because you're so busy doing uh, doing the things that, that make money, I guess. So thank you very, very much. Um, thank you to all of our Absolutely. listeners and our viewers, and thank you also to those of you who take the time to uh, listen to our podcast. Uh, if you are a podcast listener, do remember to, uh, to, to give us uh, a rating. Five stars would be wonderful. And it is, of course... A reminder to share, like, uh, or subscribe uh, on YouTube or uh, Apple uh, Podcasts or Google or wherever you are. Thank you very much once again for joining us and looking forward to catching you uh, all again next week. Cheers.